So we made some good progress in our web services tutorial series so far. We've learned this magical annotation called the at web service. All you need to do to create a web service is to just annotate a class with this annotation and everything happens by default, right? So Glassfish uh, creates the visual out of it. It creates a tester. It deploys the application as a web service and life is good. And I ruined it all in the last tutorial by saying, no, this is not enough. We have to now understand and learn this mess of XML that's called the Wisdom. But to be honest, it is not really that hard. So think about what we said the Wisdom is actually supposed to do. So when you code in Java and you want to share the details of your class with the client, you send an interface. But in the case of web services, you cannot really share a Java interface because you have no idea what technology the client is using. So we send an XML interface. So this Wisdom is basically pretty much the same as a Java interface, but it's in an XML format. So to understand the Vistal, we need to understand the interface. And we already understand the Java interface, so it shouldn't be that hard, right? So think about a standard interface. Now let me create an interface, a simple interface just for testing. I'm not going to use this for the application. So I'm going to call this interface, uh, let's take the calculator example. Right, I'm writing a calculator and I want to provide an interface for a calculator. Now let's say I want to create uh, two methods. So one is to add two numbers and one is to multiply two numbers. Okay, so this is a standard Java interface. Most of the interfaces will more or less be similar, right? So you have an interface which lists the methods. So what are the important parts of this interface? Now you have, uh, let's take the first line, we have the package, and we also have the name of the interface. So these two help the JVM identify this interface. So it's basically a way to know what interface we are talking about, right? So we have the public, which is a scope. In the visual world, pretty much all interfaces are public, right? Because you want people to use it. So this is uh, kind of Java specific. It's not really related. The core essence of this interface, the purpose in life of this interface is to provide information about the content, right? So the methods. So no matter how many methods you have here, it has information about those methods. So each method itself will have the name of the method, the input arguments, and the return type. So no matter how many methods you have here, these three pieces of information should be provided for each of those methods. So let's take add. It has two input arguments, int a and int b, and it provides a return type, which is an int, right? So this is essentially what a visual should have as well. So a visual should have all these methods. It should have information about the input arguments for those methods. And it should also have the return type for that method. So let's open up our Wisdom and see if we have this information. So this is the Wisdom for our test mart application that we've been writing, right? So this Wisdom is a bit scary looking. So let's minimize this. Let's make it a bit simple. So I go to the product catalog. So there are three web methods here. So I want to eliminate two. I want to retain just one web method and see all the elements of the visual that are specific to this web method. How do I remove these web methods? I could, of course, just select this and delete, but I'm gonna do it another way. So when you go to this web method annotation and uh, see what are the properties, there is a property called exclude. So this exclude is a Boolean, which lets us, as the name says, exclude a web method. So when I have a web method annotated with exclude is equal to true, then Glassfish is not gonna publish this as a web method, okay? So I'm gonna do the same thing for here. I'm just gonna say exclude equals true. So I want Glassfish to exclude these two web methods. So I'm essentially having a web service with just this one single web method. Now let's see how the visitor looks like. I'm gonna save this and republish. Okay, so now if I refresh this, so this is a bit better, but this is still a bit complicated to an untrained eye. So let's 
collapse all these different elements. Okay, so this is something uh, that consists of all the high level elements of the whistle. And let's take this one by one. So let's take this element. This element is called the port type and the name is product catalog. So if I expand this, so you see here there is an operation called get product categories, right? So this is same as the method that we have here. Of course, these two methods are not uh, valid. We have just this one web method, okay? So at the base level, we have an operation that takes in an input and it returns an output, okay? So this is what we saw as an interface, right? So we have operations defined, which take in input and output, okay? But what about all this other stuff? What do all of those things do? Let's take this types, for example. What is a type doing here? To understand what a type section is, let's take a look at our interface again. Now this is a simple add method that takes in two ints. But now let's say instead of an int, I pass in a custom data type. So let's say I have my data type class, okay? I'm passing in two objects of my data type class and this add method accepts these two objects and adds them both and returns an object of my data type, okay? So it's not an add of two numbers anymore. It's adding two objects of my data type. So now what does this line say? This line says, hey, I'm an add method and I take two objects of this type. Don't ask me what these types are. I don't know. I'm just saying that I'm taking these two objects and I'm returning an object of the same type. And if you wanna understand what the type is, you need to go to the Java class where this type is defined, right? So the type information is not available in the interface. So essentially it's a different Java class. So this similar principle is available over here. So you have types defined, okay? So if you have a custom data type, you define all the types over here and then the input and output are just references to those types, right? Just like you have an input argument here which says, hey, I'm an input argument of this type. So the same way you can have an input here, which is I'm an input of this type, okay? But there is one minor difference in the way inputs and outputs are defined in the WSDL. In the WSDL, for an operation, a method is an operation here. So for an operation, there is only one input tag and one output tag. You might be wondering how is it possible because there could be multiple inputs right? There, there's only one in output, so this is fine, but then there could be multiple inputs to an operation. How is it possible that there's only one input for every operation? So the way it works is, if there are multiple inputs, if there are multiple input arguments to any method, they are bundled together into what's called as a message, okay? So every method in a whistle takes in one message as the input and one message as the output, okay? So if there are multiple arguments, you have to bundle them into a message. So if you look here, the input is of the message, get product categories, okay? And the output is of the message, get product categories response. So these messages are also defined separately. So if you look here, there is a message called get product categories. See here? And there's a method message called get product categories response. And the input takes this message and the output takes this message. So essentially, you have types defined for all your custom types and you have messages defined which consist of different types. So a message consists of types and an operation takes an input as one message and an output as one message. So this is at a high level what a visual structure is. But now there are a few other things that the whistle defines. A whistle defines what's called as a binding. So a binding is basically how a web service accepts these values, okay? So you look here, there is an element called SOAP binding, which says the transport is HTTP, which means that this web service accepts SOAP requests over HTTP. There are different ways in which web services accepts requests. So this one happens to be HTTP. So this is the definition. And then there are a few other definitions over here, which we'll come to later. But the binding is just information about how the service 
accepts requests and gives response. Now the service itself is just a list of ports. So this service, product catalog service, defines a port, which is the product catalog port, which is available at this address. So the SOAP address is this one where the service is made available. And the service has a port which follows this binding and the binding is defined over here. So if your head is spinning right now with all these different types, let's keep this aside and let's open up our web service one more time. This is so simple, isn't it? So this is our web method and this has generated all this XML. Now how would Glassfish have done it? So how Glassfish does it is, whenever it sees a class with the at web service annotation, it's gonna create a web service and a port, right? So this is a web service called the product catalog service. It just takes the name of the class and creates a service and then creates a port for it. The port has bindings which tell, you know, how the web service is gonna get called. We saw it was HTTP and a few other stuff. Don't worry about it, but it creates a service and a port. Okay, stay with me so far. Now what happens is, now inside this port, it looks at all the methods which have been annotated with at web method. Right, so here there's just one method. So no matter how many methods are there, it's gonna create operations for them, right? So a port consists of operations. Now this is the name of the operation. The method name, the same as the operation name. And irrespective of whether this takes arguments or not, it creates an input message and an output message for each operation. Now the input message consists of as many types as there is to send. Now if this takes two parameters, then it would consist of two types. If it takes three parameters, it would consist of three types, but it would be just one message. So the input message would consist of all the input arguments bundled as a message, and then the return type would be an output message. And each message would have types. So this list of string is a type. So a type would be defined for it, and then the message would point to the type. So this hopefully explains the complete flow. So you have service, with port, port defines bindings, and the binding points to a port type which has operations. Each operation has input and an output. The input has a message and the output has a message. And each message refers to types and the types are defined in its own section. So hopefully this made sense. Uh, I would definitely encourage you to go through the visual and try to identify all the different parts. This was a tough one for me to explain because I was trying to find ways to simplify this. I hope I have simplified it for you. If you have any questions, I definitely encourage you to break this apart and try to find out how all these different things are getting generated from Glassfish. You can change the names of all these different things and see how the names get changed in the visual and hopefully that'll be a good representation of what gets translated to what okay so in the next tutorial now that we have understood what these different types are in the next tutorial we'll try to understand how we can change all these different defaults so you see all these defaults are getting picked up from the method names and the variable names and the class names in our java class we'll try to understand how we can change these stuff and try to you know give our own names and uh, make sure that they're not uh, automatically derived. We don't want these to be automatically derived. We want to control all the different aspects of all this XML that's generated. So we'll take a look at that in the next tutorial. Thanks for watching.